My name is Alan, and welcome back to the Sound Speeds Podcast, Episode 2. Now, I was not born with good looks, so hopefully you hear from my personality. Otherwise, this is going to be a long episode. It is Saturday, September 21st, 2019. Let's get into it. Amazon Impulse Buys. I don't understand how Amazon figures that they're going to sell something to me by recommending it, but they usually have a pretty good chance of doing it if it is something random and maybe something I haven't seen before. And this is no different. My Staplist stapler is actually a pretty cool little thing that was recommended to me. I don't exactly know how it does what it does, but first of all, if you're going to use it on something, expect it to have a hole in it because like, for example, this little piece of paper that I have folded up in half and then in half again, if I want to use the Staplist stapler on it, I am going to thread it in there, press the little button, and what it does is, <laughs> you see it's starting to slide out there. Uh, and, and surprisingly enough, that doesn't do anything. I don't understand what that hole is there for. It doesn't really seem to do anything at all. But if you use it on something, it makes a little hole, it makes a little slit, and then takes the, the paper that it removed from the hole and folds it into the slit. I don't really know if you can see it, but it's actually a pretty cool little thing right there. What do you use it for? Well, I know that a lot of people are like, well, I don't want to damage a piece of paper. But if you have children that love staplers and they love to staple things, for example, like you have a whole bunch of loose pieces of paper that come home from the teachers and you're tired of them ending up all over the place. Or a staple gets pulled out of something and you're like, why? Where's the other half of this thing? The stapler stapler is a good find for your kids. Now, personally, one of the things I use it for is doing just what you saw me do here, sealing little pieces of paper that I'm not going to need to access until later. And sometimes I'll put on the outside, I'll write what I, what, you know, it's supposed to be for. Like, you know, here's a, a note that I'm, I'm going to reopen this and address this in October. If there's a piece of paper, I need to do that. Um, sometimes I'll do it with tax documents or I'll put something inside of a folder and I'll seal it up so that way I know if it's been tampered with. Now, it sounds kind of weird and it probably is, but it's also kind of fun. And so if you have any interest in getting yourself a staple stapler for whatever reason, then you can get one at the link down in the description. Something sound. Ever since I started Sound Speeds, I've received some questions over and over again. And one of them is, if you're on a budget, are there any wireless lavalier microphone systems or wireless systems at all on Amazon that are worth considering? Well, I haven't wanted to dedicate an entire episode of Sound Speeds to it, so I thought it would be ideal for this podcast. Now, I am here on Amazon right now, and I figured what we would do is look up wireless lavalier. Nope, 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 nope. Lavalier, right there. And if we were looking this up, the first thing I'm going to do is sort by average customer reviews, not by price. If you look for price, it's going to come up with a bunch of low budget garbage. And if you do it by average uh, customer review, then those are people that have bought it and they can give you an idea of how their experience with it has been. That's going to put you probably in a better position to at least maybe trust some of the opinions that are that are coming from because to me personally i if i buy something i would rather it be something that i if i don't have any experience with it that i can at least maybe read some reviews about and sometimes these reviews will only have like five or ten something like that try to avoid those units and maybe go for something that has a little bit more now this this one right here has for example, it has a picture of a DSLR and what you would plug in a, a cold shoe and it says lavalier and blah, blah, blah. But it also has a five star review or a five star rating here with 27 people uh, giving it that customer review. It does have unanswered questions. I'm going to avoid those right now. And I'm going to first go through and look and see what kind of devices it's for. Now, it shows here an external speaker you can plug it up to. It shows that you can plug it into various different components. And it also shows some adapters here. And it says it's not ideal for small Bluetooth speakers, but it's okay with big P PA speakers. So obviously, you want to make sure that you know what you're going to be using it for. Now, another thing it shows is the DSLR. Is this it? No. Here's the plug that I want to point out here. See this quarter inch or 6.35 millimeter uh, plug right there? If you're plugging it into your camera, it may not work for you properly because you have to add an adapter onto it. And an adapter has two problems with it. Number one is it may not fit perfectly over top of what you're adapting. And the other thing is if 
that weight, that weight that sits on the connector could end up being a problem, not just because it's easier to accidentally knock out or because the thing is sticking off and you can't really move your camera very fast. But the one of the other big reasons is because over the course of time, it's going to wear down, down that jack and that's going to do a lot of damage to it. So um, these are things to consider. Obviously, comfort is something that's probably going to go out the window when you start looking at these units. But one of the other things to consider here is frequency. Now, most of the time, when you're looking at these wireless units, the, the cheap ones, especially the unbranded ones, they are being drop shipped from China. They're being sent from China and they're not going to have something like uh, it, it, like this one, for example, says free shipping. But you're, it says, you know, it does have an option for two day shipping at checkout and it is sold by the same company that manufactures it. So you can probably expect it to be sent from someplace in America if that's the case. And if, and if that is the case, it has a better chance of being of working in a frequency range that is legal to the United States. But many of these wireless units that you can get are not. Now, all right, hold on one second. I just spotted something here I find very interesting. If you look through the pictures here, and this goes exactly with what I was saying, current frequency 627. Now, as of the time of this video, Anything below 700, like 700 megahertz all the way down to 470 is considered legal in the United States. But after Je July 13th of 2020, 608 me me uh, megahertz and below down to 470 is legal. So 627 is legal now, but it's not going to be after July 13th of next year. Now, if you scroll down here, look at this. It is preset with 902 to 928 megahertz. That's outside of the legal bandwidth. Now, there is a small little bit between, uh, what is it, 941 and like 945 or something, I believe, that is now available if you'd like to buy a wireless unit up that high. But this one here is preset to an illegal in the United States ban. That tells me a couple of things. Number one is this should not be sold in America because it has not gone through any, any kind of official FCC testing. And I can tell you that straight up because the FCC would not approve of that frequency being released in a wireless unit being sold on Amazon. So this company here is selling something that you should not be able to buy here in America. Let's go to yet another uh, product here just to look at. Um, all right, you have multiple units right here. Let's, let's go for a multi. Um, let's see if there's like an eight love kit or something like that. Photo, photo welt. Hmm. Interesting. Sometimes what you'll run into, and I'll, I'll stop if I find one is they'll have multiple microphones going into the same, just like this one. Okay. It says sponsored four channel. This is a Phoenix pro four channel. Now, if you're looking at something like this, one of the big things to keep in mind is what your application is. Four wireless units that are all part of the same wireless units will hopefully be frequency coordinated. If you have to coordinate frequencies yourself, you may run into some problems if you have no experience doing so. But if they're already coordinated, you know they're at least going to work with themselves. And it says right here, VHF, very high frequency signal. So chances are these four mics are going to be set to work within the system itself. It's been tuned to it. As for the other wireless in the air, because it's not switchable frequency-wise, if you end up having any kind of interference in the air, that could really mess up your day if you're hoping to use all four of these. Let's just say you're going to be buying this $140 unit expecting to get some sort of um, – do a, do a, let's say a PA show. You're going you're gonna to be up on a stage and you're hoping to use these microphones to talk out to the audience and you're going to take a line into their board and hopefully it's going to all just work magically. In a lot of places that you go, they already coordinate their own wireless. And if they don't and you're bringing your own system, like for example, this one, you could run into a lot of interference in the air, especially around schools, uh, in auditoriums, that kind of thing where they have their own wireless. Even if they're not on, sometimes they could have stuff in the air just flying around little RF in the air that is going to impede the ability of this wireless unit to work well. And this is also a very simple unit here. It has volume controls for A, B, C, and D. Does it have a picture of the back? Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. If they don't, okay, this one does here. Here's another good thing that you need to note. If you're trying to isolate your tracks, meaning that 
each of these four microphones needs to have its own recording. It's not going to happen with something like this. And on cheap wireless units, usually this is one of the issues you run into, that you have RFA, RFB, RFC, RFT. Those are radio frequency A, radio frequency B. Then whatever you bring up is going to be going out a balanced A and most likely balanced B at the same time because there's no pan. You cannot pan left or right. If you could pan left or right with each channel, then maybe you could send one wireless to the left and one to the right if they're the, the two hosts, for example. And then it, you could bring up the other ones for whoever they're talking to as needed. But considering that there is not, it might as well be one line out. It doesn't matter if it's balanced or unbalanced at this point because it is just going to be a mono signal from each of the microphones. You can't control which of those two channels it's coming um, out of. It's going to be coming out of both of them identically. So if you are trying to isolate record each of the channels, not going to happen with this wireless unit. And if it doesn't matter what the switches are on the microphone, you know, because you're not going to be able to change them. They're, they're hardwired or hard uh, programmed to be one frequency. You can't change them. Let's scroll down here and look look a little bit more at it. It it has body packs uh, that you can buy for it. Also, add for more flexibility here. Doesn't even say the frequency range. Chances are it's not going to if it's not already been mentioned so far. Okay, so if it doesn't mention the frequency range, that could also be an issue because, again, you want it to be compatible within a good frequency range. Now, I did say that 700 megahertz down to as low as 470 is legal right now. And also, and, and recall that after July 13, 2020, anything from 470 to 608 is going to be the legal. And that means we're losing 608 to 700. So even if it's within that frequency range, I wouldn't necessarily recommend buying anything within it right now because it's probably not going to work ideally for you. Why do I say that? There's a lot of people out there that are starting to experiment with that frequency range, even though they have not yet uh, activated it. And even though other people can still use it as of now. So um, I would not necessarily buy anything outside of the, uh, the 470 to 608 frequency ranges of now because you also want it to be compatible. Now, I just clicked on another one also released by the same company. This is also being sold on uh, on Amazon with free shipping, and it does not say anything about – oh, it does say wanted by Thursday, September 19th. Well, that tells me right there that uh, since I'm actually shooting this on Wednesday morning, like early morning at 2 a.m., it tells me that this wireless unit is being sold here in America and not being sent from China. And if you look down through here, the frequencies, 541.9, 546.3, 561.6, 561.6, So this unit here, even though it looks like it has a digital readout that you might be able to change frequencies on, you might not be able to. And I would say might not be able to, and I can almost guarantee it, because if you look over here, there are no switches to allow you to change frequencies on it. That doesn't it doesn't look like it's on there either. But but being that they automatically tell you what frequencies that it is hardwired to and programmed with, those are the frequencies that you're stuck with. And so it's not going to really be something that you are going to be able to change. And it, it also sells different frequency blocks. Let's look at frequency block one and see what that is. It looks like the same thing. So you, I guess want to make sure you figure out what that's going to be because there's two different wireless units. This, this is 5,000 B and up here it says 5,000 C. So you want to find out what those things, what those are. Uh, does it tell you in any of the pictures? See, it, it shows you what's on the inside of the, bo of the body pack. And it's just batteries and a switch again. If you run into issues, it's not going to be able to, you know, allow you to switch units. You're not going to be able to switch anything. Now, here, if you noticed, notice it says it has channel one balanced XLR output. Here, let me see if I can actually get into this picture. And it has, what in the world? AF balanced output, AF balanced output. So I, I guess... I would want to do a little bit more research here, but it almost looks like there are outputs for each and every channel on this one. So if you wanted to ISO record each one of them, it may be possible with this, but definitely you, you would want to scroll down, read some of the reviews, 
and see what people's opinions are of it. Does it actually work? It says it's capable of getting up to about 260 feet. On cheap wireless, I usually cut that into about a quarter because that's something that you really don't want to rely on, especially if you activate multiple channels at the same time. If you look at an RF meter, if you bring up something like RF Explorer, you turn on one transmitter in the area, you see one little spike. You bring on a second transmitter and you're not going to see a second spike. You're going to see three total spikes. So it actually brings up two spikes usually in the area. You add a third and you're adding maybe four more because every time you add more frequencies and channels in the air, they have got to be coordinated. They have to be able to talk to each other. And in doing so, there's also harmonics that do naturally occur between radio frequencies, not just the sound that you and I speak and hear around us, but in the frequencies of wireless too. Those are something that's very, very important that you have to consider um, as well. So in addition to everything else, you have your, your body packs, you have all this, and you want to consider things like what are you going to be doing with it? If you need to isolate your, your outputs, this would be a unit that you would at least consider getting. So, and some of them have, I've seen on here, have like multiple cha channels. They're like as many as eight channels. And those things to me are just a joke because it all mixes down to one or two, uh, one or two little frequencies and, or one or two outputs. And by, by the time you turn on eight hard coded wireless transmitters and go out of one output, that it's all mixed down, that is crazy to me. You can't do anything with it. You get scratchy lava on one of them, you're gonna have a scratchy lava on everything that comes out and try to bring up eight channels that you cannot isolate and, and do a pre-fade listen PFL on, you have no idea what you're listening to. So don't get anything like that. In my opinion, it's just gonna cause you more trouble than it's worth. So hopefully this is giving you a little bit of insight as to what you should and what you should not buy if you look on Amazon. Just to highlight real quickly, if you got to ask yourself what you're going to be using it for. If you, if the connector that comes out of the wireless unit is not going to be compatible with your device like that DSLR camera, it's not the right size. If it's not the right size, you don't want to have to adapt it in order to get it in what you're going to be using it for because you could end up damaging your camera or your recorder, whatever. And then you want to make sure that you have proper isolated tracks if you're planning on multi-tracking. And ideally, selectable frequencies is another good thing to get. I didn't mention that before, but it is something that you should definitely consider because if, if you know, you're going to run into RF in the world. I run into RF every single day and we'll have to rescan anytime we're on location. This is working with thousand plus dollar wireless transmitters. And so obviously little cheap things like this on Amazon, you're going to have the same kind of issues. So if that's the case, then you want to pr try to pre-plan for that and have a couple of backup options, especially if you have multiple wireless units, unless you're just planning on using it as a backup. Oh, try this one. That one's not working right. Try this one. That one's not working right. Try this one. That could be your backup plan. If that's the case, then maybe one of those that's just a fixed frequency and has four microphones in the kit may be something suitable for you. But if you're looking at lavalier microphones, I would not under any circumstance recommend you to buy something that you pl pl put a lav on and it goes multiple lavs out of one output out of the wireless unit. Ever since starting SoundSpeeds, there are some questions I received over and over again. And this happens even to this day. And one of the big ones is, why don't I do intros? Well, to be completely honest, when I watch videos and I see someone say, hey, welcome to my channel here. Thanks for coming to watch this video. In this video, I'm going to be discussing this. And then they go into a 20 second intro. Then they come back and say, hi again. Remember who I am? I'm such and such. I'm the host of this channel and blah, blah, blah. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and maybe even send a donation. I'd really, really appreciate it. It will really help me out. <sighs> to me, that's a waste. Yes, I would love for you to subscribe to be here on the podcast and on SoundSpeeds, but only if you get value out of it. I'm not going to tell you to subscribe, hoping that you subscribe and then never see me again. If you have no interest in me, you're not going to subscribe. If you subscribe only because I tell you to, yeah, you may see me in your subscriptions and say, oh yeah, well, let me see what he's up to now. But in all honesty, 
to me, I think that it's much more, it, it's much more time friendly and more respectful to you to not waste your time. Let me explain that. When I watch a video and I know they have an intro, I know exactly how many times I have to press a button to fast forward through it. If I'm watching, for example, Good Mythical Morning, then I know if I double press, as soon as I see them start their opening thing, I can double press that button probably three times in advance, 30 seconds in, and it's going to give me a pretty good chance of getting into content. If not, and they're going into a spiel about swag, I have to probably press it probably another two times to advance another 20 seconds. So that way I can skip through to the content I really care about. And some channels are a little more formulaic. They, they just introduce things, they get right to it. Uh, some of them will, will waste a lot of time in trying to convince you to give to them, even though they haven't even given to you yet. If you just land on my channel and you've never seen my video before, why do you want to do me a favor and like and subscribe to my channel when you don't know anything about this? As far as you're concerned, you come to my video and you start watching it and I'm wasting your time from the get-go telling you, you owe me before I give you the content, I'm going to dangle this carrot for a second. You got to like, share, and subscribe. This is one of the reasons I think that people are so used to just clicking and fast forwarding through videos, looking for the content because it happens so much. You go to PewDiePie and he starts throwing ads at you. You go watch Mr. Beast. He will suddenly in the middle of it, throw an ad in there. You watch a lot of channels and they will throw an ad in the middle of it. Sure. I understand monetization. I understand having to make your sponsors happy, but I also understand that I will very quickly you know, when I'm when I'm starting to design an episode, I will very quickly try to streamline that show and get right into the content so that way I'm not wasting your time. To me, time is valuable. When you spend that time with me, it's time that you could have spent on anything else. Sure, you probably go to work and when you are not working and trading your life for that paycheck and bringing it home, what you choose to spend your time on is very, very important. And if you happen to spend that time watching one of my videos on YouTube, hopefully that's because you're getting something out of it. You're learning about sound, let's say, and you, and it's because you have a hobby or maybe you have an interest in doing what I do professionally, or maybe you're another sound professional and you want to learn a tweak that you might be able to use on another show. Whatever the case may be, you are tra trading your life for you know, uh, for, for that time that you're spending on my channel. And when you do that, I want to try to maximize the goodness that comes out of that time. Now, me personally, I listen to a lot of the things that I listen to on my drive into work. I've listened to a lot of, uh, of, of audiobooks, podcasts, that kind of amusement to me is what I spend to multitask as I'm driving into work. So you may be doing the same exact thing and putting my podcast on as you drive into work one day and that's fine by me i mean you're you're listening to me spending time with me and that's that's cool you could be spending that time on anything else though you could be listening to another podcast you could be listening to the radio and learning about current events or what have you you don't need to tell you all the different possibilities but when you spend your time with me I want to try to streamline that. Sure, sometimes I sit down at the computer and I'll walk you through a process, but that's usually a learning procedure that I will have to walk through and show you step-by-step step something. And if I blast through it too fast, it will go over someone's head. Sometimes you can follow my movements on the screen and I can even cut out some of that sometimes by just streamlining it and showing you clip, 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 but not always. So what I, where I'm going with this is the time you spend watching my channel I don't want to waste time by telling you an intro, then showing you my special sound speeds intro, then reintroducing the topic. I want to just get to it and save you maybe 30 seconds of your life. And hopefully you won't skip around my video as much if you realize that the content I'm delivering is fairly streamlined. Because when you think about it, to, to put time in perspective for you, if you know, don't know the value of a year, Ask a child that just failed a grade and has to repeat it. If you don't know the value of a month, ask someone that just received an eviction notice. If you don't know the value of a week, ask someone that just got back from the first week-long vacation they've, ever, they've taken in years. If you don't know the value of a, of a day, ask someone whose 
favorite candidate just lost an election. If you don't know the value of an hour, hour, then ask a parent whose child just sustained a life-threatening injury. If you don't know the value of a minute, ask a police officer that just lost her key witness. If you don't know the value of a second, ask someone that barely avoided a traffic accident. And if you don't know the value of a 10,000th of a second, ask an Olympic silver medalist. Wrong answers only. Nick asks, how do you avoid having your boom shadow appear on camera? Well, the most obvious choice there is to not throw it out there over your, your talent there. Obviously, if you throw your boom out there, there's a chance that you're going to cross a light. If you cross a light, you're going to chance creating a shadow. Right now, if you look at my, my, the light behind me, there's a light coming from the camera. And if I put my hand between that light and the background, you can see my shadow on that. Well, the camera is there. Now I'm causing a shadow that you're going to see. The most obvious way is to don't put your boom out there. You may be a boom operator, but you can just hold your boom back and point your microphone out there. If the sound mixer has done a good job and bought good microphones, you should be able to get good enough sound by simply just kind of pointing it like Moses with his staff. Just extend your arm and point that microphone directly at someone who is talking. If you're not getting good sound out of that, reach for a microphone with a longer reach. That's going to be something that you can use to dig in on that really good sound. Another good thing to keep in mind is that your director of photography has put up multiple different lights to light the scene. And if one of them is giving you a problem and you're shadowing on there, then it is perfectly within your right to go over there and kill that light. I mean, you don't need to actually have 15,000 lights on. How many times do you run into the real world and have 5,000 different lights on in that room to just light the room up? It's not efficient for power, is it? And if you don't want it to be efficient, if you want it to be realistic, you can help out that DP. You obviously understand you know, enough about lighting to know which light was causing the shadow, right? So you might as well go over there and kill that light. You're helping the DP out because in, in order for that DP to have to address it, if you go over and say, hey, can you help me out with this boom shadow? They're going to have to come out there. They'll look at everything and try to figure it out and say, hmm, this to me, it looks like I may have to bring in a flag and cut it. And it's going to involve the grips. And those guys are busy. Don't need to mess with them. Maybe an electrician has to, has to, you know, change a light intensity or something to help you out. You don't need to ask them or bother them on any of that stuff. Just go over there and kill that light. And if killing the light isn't an option because there's no switch on it and the plug, the Bates plug or something like that is way too high, then another option you have is to simply pan the light off. You can just turn it away and that's fine too. Now, <clears throat> another good thing that you also need to keep in mind, this is this is like the the one of the other things is if your boom is in is causing a shadow and it's the light is not really, really high, you know, and it's not something you can kill for that reason. Another thing is if it's a floor standing light, just stand in front of it again, just like with how the DP doesn't need to have so many lights on the set, they don't need to have all of that you know, light coming from the direction. If you stand in front of the light, then there's still going to be bounce. It's still going to be bouncing light off of your shirt and bouncing off the walls and everything else. They're going to get the idea of the light coming from that direction. That's really all it takes. And you may be booming and going in and out, and that should be enough, you know, to, to allow enough usable light to get past you. Right. So, I mean, you got to boom someplace, so you might as well stand there. So, you know, being a boom operator is a very, very tricky thing. You could be diplomatic about a lot of things, but many people, especially sound mixers, really appreciate a boom operator that has a go-getter attitude, that knows how to just accomplish, get great sound, and do what it takes to be on a film set and get that good sound. The less you have to involve other departments, the better. And so those hopefully are a couple of things that you can keep in mind for how to get great sound as a boom operator without your boom shadow going into the shot. I'm going to be telling you a story about a show I worked on a few years ago. Now, I don't do a whole lot in reality TV. Mainly, the, the when I used to do reality TV, it was usually to fill in a gap between shows. I'd be working on a TV show or a movie. I wouldn't start another one for another two or three weeks, and I'd say, okay, well, that's enough time for me to maybe fill in for somebody or to be an additional you know, sound mixer or something like that on a, on a reality show. And I would do those because... It was something to do. It would, it, you know, it would, it would keep me occupied. The more time I spend off work, 
the more stuff I buy and I don't probably need to. So if I'm at work, chances are I'm making money and not spending it at least at the same rate as I would be if I were off work. So this story here, I'm not going to name the show, but I will just say that it is a very, very large, kind of like an American Idol type singing competition type show that is for more gospel type music. Well, they had auditions in Atlanta and they were looking for sound mixers. I think they were looking for 14 or 15 of them total. And because of the rate they were paying, it was not, and, and the fact that you were using their gear, it was not appealing to a lot of sound people. A lot of sound people want a higher rate and they want to use their own gear because you don't want to have to have gear failing you. You want to have a, a, a plan, a backup plan. If you bring your own gear, you know it's maintained, you know it's history, you know how it's hooked up, you know everything about it. Therefore, if you use it, you're basically buying backups. You're buying everything from that person and that is the very best way to do it. But on this show, it was not the case. They weren't paying a great rate for one. Why did I do it? Well, because their shifts were short, or at least if you got this one shift, it was short. They had two different shifts going. If you started in the early morning shift at like you know five, six, seven, or eight a.m., then you would usually trade off some with somebody at you know star, star, uh, at staggering like two, three, four, five, whatever. Well, there was always one shift that was only about eight hours long. And for the price they were paying, I looked at that and said, I can do that for eight hours, even though usually the audition days would come on the on a day I'd have a Friday day. So I would end up working really, really late Saturday, Friday night into Saturday, and I would get off work at 3 a.m. and I'd be like so exhausted and say, great, I got to go in at six. Might as well drive right there, sleep in the parking lot, wake up and go inside and work and then go home and rest for real and then, you know, do the check later. Now. You could easily argue that and say you were in the wrong still for accepting a low rate. You're right, probably so. But considering that I knew how to play the system on that from the first year I was there, I was pretty much in in the the golden spot there with that time slot. They they called me because I was a sound person. They knew that I'd be interested in doing it if I could pick my shift, and I did. So the story, I, now that I've kind of set it up for you a little bit, we had maybe three out of the 14 sound mixers were skilled and they would usually put us on the more difficult stuff and then they would get other people they could at least have filling the roles of sound mixer on the show now i'm sure you're familiar with the content and the idea of people going in to do an audition with the judges and then they if they're a, a good person uh, you know going to be progressing to the next you know uh, level and it's a fairly interesting person or they have a personality a story that's going to be told on the air or if they're a complete crazy person that should never be on TV and they're going to be insane, they might follow them around too. Well, most of the time, being this is a show about gospel type stuff, it was usually people that had a story. They were a single mother of 10 kids. And I'm not kidding. That actually did happen. Or they're a, uh, or, or they're a person that has like six jobs and their story is that, that they always wanted to be a gospel singer and they only sing at their church on Sunday. That's the only thing they ever have time for all these different stories that you have. And I would go off and, and be assigned. They would say, all right, Alan, I want you to follow this camera around and do interviews outside. I'm like, sure. So I'd go outside and, and set up for a bit. I'd op occupy a certain station and then I would go off and do something else. I would, they would say, all right, Alan, we're about to do interviews upstairs where we have all the judges coming in and you're going to go over there and make sure the lives sound good. And you want, I want to get, really get you on there. You want your best people to be the people that follow your talent because that's the stuff that you cannot replace. So because they would have so many other people there that were capable of doing the interviews and stuff, those are not going to be nearly as critical as making sure that if the actors and the the judges are on that are on the show uh, are doing a segment that their sound sounds good the first time, so that's when you're going to bring in the pro. Well, until that gets, gets going in the day, usually we're off doing something else. Well, in this particular story, I was set up to do an interview outside. I set up a station where the boom is obviously going to sound better than the lav. Uh, so what I did is I set up the, the boom on a stand where it was up and over the actor. And I, I was there for probably about two hours doing interviews where they could just sit down 
and they don't have to change out lavs and have this little microphone sticking out and that kind of thing. They just have a microphone over top of them. And then I did tell when they pulled me away to go off and do an interview station, I did go and and ask. Um, I, I told the person that was filling in, I said, this particular station has two things that you need to be aware of. Channel one is the boom. Channel two is the lav mic. The lav mic is sitting right over here right now, not in use. Turn it on, throw it on them, and it should be fine. Uh, you know, just you know how to do it. Uh, but I said, we're using the boom right now, but after a while, the sun's going to come up, and you're going to need to start using the lav. So they were like, oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. I grab my headphones, and I go, and I look back, and the person does not have headphones. Because part of the thing is they say, bring your own headphones because you're going to be changing out gear quite, quite a bit. And they were like, are you going to leave the headphones? I'm like, no, man, these are mine. And that was the first indicator to me that this person was not a professional sound person because you would always have, you know, always have your headphones with you. And if not, you're at least going to make sure you have something that you can monitor with. I went away and did some stuff on the show. And then I was brought back to the same station probably about three or four hours later. I go and I sit down uh, and, and watch over the shoulder of the, the person mixing who does not have headphones. And I'm just looking at the bag. And then I look up at the person who's speaking. That person did not have a boom over them anymore. They were wearing the lav mic. Okay, so you would expect it to hopefully have pretty good sound. When I looked down there, channel one was up, channel two was down. Okay, maybe the mixer just changed it out and channel one is now the, the lav mic and channel two is the boom. Well. As soon as the interview was done, he says, all right, well, uh, you, you're here to relieve me? I said, yeah, man, uh, go off and do what you got to do. He said, well, I'm going to lunch. And then after that, I'm going to be doing this other station. I'm like, all right, cool, man. You take care. Didn't leave with headphones. And I said to myself, you know, by then, us sound people, you know, because I recognized the, you know, the other sound people that were there. We were like looking at each other and nodding and that kind of thing. We also recognized that the people they had that were, that were playing the role of sound mixer, probably because they accepted the raid, even though they have no experience, they have no knowledge. They don't know what in the world they're doing. And this was a good indicator of that because when I sat down and I plugged in my headphones, the boom was moving the meters, which is all the person who was occupying that particular station cared about. They looked at it and said, oh, the meters are moving. Obviously, I'm getting my sound. The boom that was about five feet over to the side still on the stand was getting the sound of the world around them and the the line of the people that were going through to to get their audition done the meters were moving but it was the wrong meters it was the the sound of nature cars driving by and that kind of thing for about three or four hours the person that had been occupying that station had been hoping to use that lav but the lav was not up this is one of the reasons why you hear me say so many times, it is so critical for you to hire an actual sound person, to have a sound person be hired that understands how to use a camera that is better to get than it is to, to, to find someone who is a camera person that knows enough about sound to be dangerous. Floating segment, questions answered. Peter at Alarm Clock Films asks, I am a student studying film, but also have an interest in production, post-production sound. I was wondering if it'd be worth joining the CAS, Cinema Audio Society, and or the MPSC, Motion Picture Sound Editors, as a student member. What would, the what would be the benefits? Is it even worth pursuing? I plan to do this move to LA and do this professionally when I'm out of college. Oh boy, is this a good question and one I'm so glad you asked. Let's start off by addressing one little thing, the money. Is it worth financially? On the CAS website, an active member is fairly expensive, but a new member, $40.95 as a student group. And, and that's kind of interesting. Membership dues on MPSC, Motion Picture Sound Editors, is not the 175 or 160. It is $35. So, wow, what does it take to become one of these wonderful CAS people? Well, the qualifications to get in as an active member are different. Obviously, you want to have the CAS at the end of your name if you're an active member. In order to do that, you have to be approved. And, and they, they don't always accept new members, but when they have in the past, in order to get in, you have to have a certain number of credits that are, that are recognized. 
and you've got to be doing this a certain number of years. Then you have to be voted in. As an associate member, I've been a member of CAS for the past few years. As an associate member, I am not allowed to vote, nor am I on, on, on movies or TV shows that I think should be up for an award. But I do receive all the other benefits. I don't get to put CAS at the end of my name. And associate members are, cannot be boom operators. So that's the reason why I'm not an active member. I've tried petitioning them and saying, please allow us to be, even if it takes twice as long, uh, but they don't want to have non-mixers have the CAS at the end of their name. Okay. So in order to be a student member, it says you have to be an individual act, uh, individual actively enrolled in a recognized education program with an interest in the art of cinematic sound. It'll have to be accompanied by an appropriate uh, substantiated records. That basically means that it's got to be approved. Some staff member has to basically say, yeah, I got your back on this one. You are indeed role enrolled in a sound program. And therefore, you are uh, somebody that would be eligible to be in the CAS. And they do require you to re-enroll every single year if memory serves. As for the um, uh, motion picture sound editors, this is their actual membership to get in. And if you notice, it's the same exact thing, starting off with the faculty name. And at the top, it just says, hey, what is, uh, you know, uh, to qualify a student must be enrolled in an accredited school in the appropriate field uh, studies of entertainment media, film, gaming, animation, blah, blah, blah. After three members as a student member, members have uh, can be automatically upgraded to an affiliate membership without a reapplication process fee, but they do want to charge you the upgrade fee. Okay, so it is so easy to join. We've established that. Now, what benefits are there in it? Now, I can only speak for CAS, but as for CAS, you first of all are part of an organization with peers that are recognized. They've won Academy Awards, Emmys. They are very, very good at their crafts. Top people in the industry. Those are good people for you to be to, to be to be in with. Chances are, even though I, I I'm I'm gonna tell you things that I know from being an associate, I'm assuming that it extends to student as well. You also will receive CAS Quarterly Magazine, which is a magazine written by CAS members for CAS members. And it has all kinds of articles in here about sound and it interviews people that worked on Academy Award winning movies and what secrets did they have, uh, tricks of the trade, new products. You see all kinds of really awesome articles about how to tweak a setting and how to do a little thing that was done, a really awesome audio effect in a movie. How is that done? Well, it'll show you how. That right there is really cool. We also, at Academy Awards time, we're sent a bunch of screeners because they want, they don't know who is an active, who's a student membership, who's an associate. So the screeners are sent to all members. So that way you can get a chance to see movies and TV shows. I think they're, they're, they're actually, uh, now that I remember correctly, I think they're starting to not do the screeners for the TV shows. But still, you're going to be sent a lot of screeners for these movies that you should have for the consideration. They would like you to vote on them when you're an active member. Now, uh, one of the things that they did this last year that I thought was really cool is they uh, is Netflix wanted you to watch their Netflix shows that were submitted, and so they gave a three months credit when you open up the little thing and had a, a code on there you could put in for a coupon that gave you three months free Netflix. So that right there would actually pay for your you know student membership practically, but right there, as if there wasn't anything else, that would be awesome. But you also have the option to go to the CAS Awards in LA. And you can, you're, you're going to have, you say, have to pay your way, but you would have the option of becoming, of going there. You receive the emails from CAS that tells you that you can go and you can, uh, you can go to those events. As a matter of fact, on their CAS website, it even has events that are coming up here. There's different things that you will be able to be a part of if you join CAS. Now, that's just a few membership benefits, not to mention the fact that you have the, the entire roster of membership at your fingertips. I would not suggest going down the list and pestering people, but it's really cool to be in a professional organization that is with some of the top people in the industry. And when you start doing this as a, for a living, it's really cool to say you've been in CAS since this year or to be in the motion picture sound editors since this year. Even if it's a student, 
That doesn't matter. What's, a, what's important is being a member. You're part of the club. These are where the professionals in your industry work. You've been a member for that long. It's an awesome thing to be able to say. Now, I'm not sure about the benefits that you get from being an MCS member, but there is a little thing here, forum. I don't know what forum is, but there's definitely something in there. Maybe you can ask questions about. As for education, there are awards, uh, all these different th things, and, and it even has industry links that are that you that you have. I mean, these are obviously public, but look at this: all these different uh, acronyms to the film industry are listed here, and that's really cool. There's a whole bunch of information in here. You see, they have their sound advice, mission impossible fallout. I don't know what that means, and they have their golden reel awards. I don't know what that means either, but. What I can tell you is being part of these professional organized organizations is very important. And if you can get in, definitely do so. It is so awesome to be part of these professional organizations, especially at such an inexpensive enrollment rate that you get as a student. The benefits you get, are, especially if you want to do this as a living, far outweigh the $40 that you would be spending for your, your admission. In all honesty, that is not very much at all. You spend more probably on food in a couple of days in, in college. And you could just Raymond noodle the thing for a couple of days and there you go. There's your membership uh, dues. But as for joining these professional organizations, absolutely, if you can, I'd highly recommend it. Even if it's as a student membership, I strongly recommend you doing it. Thank you for joining me for this episode of the SoundSpeeds podcast. I will be back yet again next week with another episode. The outro is provided by John S. Take it away, John. If you'd like to ask a question for the wrong answers only segment or submit a suggestion for the floating segment, send an email to soundspeedspodcast at yahoo.com. If you'd like to showcase your voiceover talents by saying this outro, make sure it sounds good, doesn't exceed 20 seconds, and send it to the same email. Hit subscribe for more content both here and on SoundSpeeds.